A uh, fly cutter's been on my short list ever since I got the new milling machine, but as short lists go, it's been looking more and more like my long list. Anyway, I've got about an hour to myself this morning, and I think I can knock one out. I'm gearing up for the surface gauge build, and although not strictly necessary, I think a large diameter fly cutter might come in handy. I pulled this ISO 30 shank out of my tooling I don't know what to do with box. This was purchased as a drill chuck adapter. You probably can't read that, but it says ISO 30 to B16. That was supposed to be a B16 cone taper on the end to drive into the back, like I said, of a drill chuck. But quite unexpectedly, my high quality import tooling isn't exactly right on the money. It's not really a B16 taper. It's unfinished taper and it doesn't really fit anything. The vendor sent me a new good one and told me to just throw this in the trash. I'm thinking it'll look a bit like this. I'll need to make the body that mounts between the taper and the high-speed steel blank. Now mounting a fly cutter onto taper tooling is probably a little bit overkill. Like mounting accuracy isn't that critical and the forces on a fly cutter usually aren't that high. Typically you'll find that fly cutters have just like a cylindrical shank. You know, it's sort of the head or the body where the tool is mounted and then a cylindrical shank that would fit into some type of machine collet in your mill. And although that would be more than sufficient, I find changing out the entire tool to be more convenient than changing out, in my case, the ER32 collets. I also don't have a lot of collet holders, and I like to keep the you know end mills and tooling I use most in those. So since I have a shank, all I really need to do is build the head that the tool steel is mounted in. I mean, not that having to build a cylindrical shank is all that much work, but as you can see for this size diameter, I would have had a lot of material to remove to get down to, I don't know, maybe a three quarter inch shank or so. So I was digging through the scrap bin and this piece jumped out at me. Thank goodness I was wearing my steel toe boots. I mean, it already looks like a fly cutter head, doesn't it? But it turns out that this stuff is like chrome cylinder rod for hydraulic cylinders. And I'm not a big fan of this material. And then I spotted this hex. Now, I'm a little hesitant to use a hex for a fly cutter. It's not entirely natural, maybe. And, you know, I don't want to have to explain to my children why everyone's giving their old man dirty looks when we're walking around the mall. you got to think of the kids when you're doing these kind of projects. But, to be honest, I think it might look cool. And, hey, about the kids, it'll build character. Oh, and another thing about the hex. I'm going to have to cut the bottom face of the fly cutter at an angle. So the tool mounts with sort of a built-in side relief. In my case, I'll probably do it about 10 degrees or so. It's not that critical. Holding a round piece like this at 10 degrees to machine the top off flat or, you know, at an angle is a little bit tricky to do. I mean, I'll need V-blocks and clamps and all that kind of stuff. The hex, on the other hand, is a lot easier to grab onto. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll see that in a minute. I'm going to cut off a piece about an inch and a half long, and I'll meet you over on the lathe to face those cuts off. So the stock already had these corners broken. I think I'm going to just leave those, save me the trouble, and I'll use this face as the sort of the spindle side, the arbor face. I'll mount the ISO 30 taper in this side. To do that, I think I'm just going to go with a press fit. Now this is tapered. I'll have to turn this cylindrical, and I'm going to make a matching hole on this side here. Okay, I couldn't really get all of that just because it was too tight between me and the tooling and the size of this bore. But after drilling it, I just went in with a small boring bar and cleaned it up as best I could. I want as flat of a bottom I can get and some consistent cylindrical size all the way down. The diameter isn't important here because I can match it on the arbor, but I want to get this as sort of as clean as I could. So I think that does it for the lathe work. Let's head over to the mill. On second thought, 
Since this is probably going to be a short video and I need some filler content, let's talk about this surface finish. Now if you've done any turning, this should look familiar to you. If you look closely, there's a change in the surface finish. Up to about this line, the surface finish is spectacular. I mean, it's like a mirror finish. And it slowly transitions into sort of that dull matte finish. I mean, it's still a fine functional part. It probably looks worse on camera than it, it is in real life. It's nice and, I, I can't tell the transition, let's put it that way, by feel. But you can see it gets sort of hazy the closer it gets to the center. Let's take a look at it on the other side without the hole in the front. The diameter at which that transition happens is exactly the same on this side as it is on the other side, like the size of that dull spot. Let's use that to talk about cutting speed. And to do that, I'm going to grab another piece of just cut off that's round. I think that might help to tell the story a little bit better, but technically it's exactly the same situation. So this is the piece of chrome shafting we saw earlier. Anyway, cutting speed. You may know it better as just speed of the famous duo feeds and speeds. Now, I'm about to walk through this on a lathe, but it's identical for any machine. In a lathe, a mill, a shaper, a drill, a grinder, etc. It's fundamentally all exactly the same. Like everything else in life, it's a matter of perspective. On a mill, the tool is spinning and the work isn't. Well, hopefully, anyway. And in the lathe, the work spins and the tool is stationary. Although intimately related, I won't get into feeds just now. Suffice it to say that feed is how fast the tool is being pushed into the work. So on a lathe, if you're turning, like an OD, the feed would be how fast the tool is moving sort of towards the chuck. If you're facing, it would be how fast it's moving towards the center. And unless you're cutting a thread, feed and speed are two separate adjustments. Speed, on the other hand, is how fast the work is moving past the tool. So the tools out here, it's a measurement of how fast this material is coming past that cutting edge. The right combination of feed and speed, depending on what material you're cutting and the type of tool that you're using, will dictate how well the cut goes in terms of material removal rate and surface finish. Though there are a couple of other things that will impact surface finish, like the nose radius on the tool, what kind of rake it has, if you're using coolant, etc. But baby steps. Back to cutting speed. So speed is a linear measurement. If you look it up, you'll find units of feet per minute, or if you have metric proclivities, it would be meters per minute. Now in this specific situation, because I have a, a low to a medium carbon steel being cut with a carbide insert, that cutting speed number is in the eight to 900 feet per minute range. You can look that up online or check the machinery's handbook. Sometimes push it to a thousand, but usually, you know, seven, eight, 900, again, depending on the material. Being a linear measurement makes it independent on the diameter of the work, which on the one hand is convenient because for any given material and tool combo, the cutting speed is always that same number. If I put medium carbon steel up against carbide tooling, be it in the lathe or the mill or the shaper, I'm always shooting for that seven, eight, 900 feet per minute. The downside, at least on a lathe, is that work tends to spin here. We don't really have a linear anything. So we need to convert that linear number into an RPM, based of course on the diameter of the work. Let's talk about simple turning first, essentially just cutting on the outside to reduce the diameter. In this particular case, the workpiece is about three inches. So one full turn is the circumference. It's nine, nine and a half inches. So if the lathe were running at one RPM, the tool would be seeing a cutting speed of nine and a half inches per minute. Again, in one minute, nine and a half inches of material come past the tool. And since nine and a half feet per minute is a far cry from the seven, eight or 900 I want to cut this material with the tool that I'm using, I've got to bump the RPM of the lathe pretty high. One RPM just isn't fast enough to turn steel. Let's consider now what happens on a facing cut. On a facing cut, the diameter that the work is effectively at, at the cutting tip is constantly changing, right? It's constantly getting smaller if you're turning from the outside in. So since the diameter is getting smaller, the RPMs need to come up a lot faster in order to get the same cutting speed towards the center that I am getting towards the edge. So let's take a look at the original workpiece again. The top speed of my lathe is 1200 RPM. It's an older lathe, it's sort of the pre-carbide era, I suppose. So it's not really built to have the high speeds that carbide really wants to run at. But you can see at this particular diameter, up until about, I don't know, an inch and a half, an inch and a quarter diameter, I'm within that, let's say 1,000 to 700 feet per minute range. 
as I start getting closer and closer to the center, where the rotational speed is essentially zero, the diameter is zero, this would want a very high RPM to keep up with the cutting tool. I mean, probably up in like the 2000 RPM range. And it's just not something my lathe can do. Now on something like a CNC lathe, if you notice, they'll run, I, I believe, in a constant surface speed mode. So the, it'll increase the RPMs the closer the cutter gets to the center. I think there's also some manual lathes that have been tricked out that have that sort of functionality built in. Now in my case, this isn't a big deal for what I'm doing, but again, surface finish, if that's what you're after, isn't necessarily just based on those cutting speeds. If I were to come in here with a high-speed steel tool that's very sharp and only take a couple of thou off, maybe something with a very generous nose radius, I'm sure I would get a mirror finish all the way in to the center. But if this were a production environment, you know, there, there really isn't time to be wasting on that kind of thing. You want a dimensional cut as fast as you can with the best possible surface finish. And also keep that in mind, of course, when you're looking at those numbers for cutting speeds, those are for industrial settings. It's for situations where time really is money.